This podcast is free and it's accessible to everyone thanks to support from listeners like you. If you value this show, please consider supporting its production by donating to our home, KUOW. It only takes a minute to give and you'll be helping to support the production of this podcast. Make a donation at KUOW.org or follow the link in the show notes. And thanks. When I was 19, undergraduate at Berkeley, I decided I wanted to be a novelist. You know, and, uh, and I also, at that very moment, I realized that I was the only Asian American writer I knew in the world. Sean Wong grew up a military brat. He lived all over the place and went to 11 schools in 13 years. And yet, in that whole time, he was never once assigned to read a book by an Asian American author, not in high school, not in college. So when he decided he wanted to be a writer, he went searching for writers that looked like him. I remember going to my American literature professor at Berkeley and saying to him, you know, I'm interested in reading Asian American authors. I had taken a class in African American literature. And so I assumed that there was uh, equivalent Asian American literature, literary history. And he told me there wasn't any. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> and I remember walking away from his office thinking to myself, that can't be right. I don't believe him. This is 10,000 Things, a podcast about modern day artifacts of Asian American life. I'm Shin Yi Pai, your host. Today, a book. I'm Alex Schwartz. I'm Nomi Fry. I'm Vincent Cunningham, and this is Critics at Large, a New Yorker podcast for the culturally curious. Each week, we're going to talk about a big idea that's showing up across the cultural landscape, and we'll trace it through all the mediums we love. Books, movies, television, music, art. And I always want to talk about celebrity gossip, too. Of course. We hope you'll join us for new episodes each Thursday. Follow Critics at Large today, wherever you get podcasts. At SoundSide, we bring you news and conversation rooted in the Pacific Northwest. Hi, I'm Libby Denkman. I think of my job hosting SoundSide as, number one, asking tough questions of powerful people, the questions you, KUOW listeners, want answered. And two, bringing you a daily slice of the fascinating, confounding, and often goofy side of life in Washington State. Join me for SoundSide at noon and 8 p.m. on KUOW or anytime on the SoundSide podcast. Sean Wong is a writer, teacher, and literary activist and has been a champion of Asian American writers his entire life. He had a knack for words and storytelling early on. But before he was a novelist, he started out as a poet, until some of his grad school mentors pulled him aside in the hallway. And they said, we encourage you to stay another year. And I remember looking at them going, what, I'm being held back a grade? <laughs> And then they said, we think you really should be a fiction writer. What they based that on? They based it on the quality of my poetry. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> I was not a good poet. <laughs> Sean wrote long narrative poems that unfolded over many pages with dialogue. One of his pieces was 20 pages long. It begged to be a novel. So interesting to me. Like, you couldn't be, like, Asian Allen Ginsberg or something that wrote, like, very long poems. While the beat writers took liberally from Asian culture and religion, Asian American authors were noticeably missing from popular culture. When a professor at UC Berkeley told Sean that no Asian American authors existed, he knew that couldn't be true. Chinese Americans at that time, we'd been here 150 years. You know, we built half of the Transcontinental Railroad. Somebody wrote a poem at some point. <laughs> Somebody wrote a story, right? We cannot have been silent. 
Sean isn't the type to take no for an answer, so he started his hunt for books by Asian American writers. Tell me about that search for Asian American writers when you started looking for them. So uh, there was a thing at that time called the card catalog. <laughs> he started in the library, where there was no such existing category yet for Asian American literature, though there was Chinese literature from China. Eventually, one of Sean's teachers introduced him to Jeff Chan, another aspiring writer studying literature. Jeff knew Frank Chin, a guy in Berkeley, who had published one short story. That accomplishment impressed Sean, so he called up Frank Chin on the phone. And I said, uh, I'm Chinese American. I write, you know, poetry and stories. And I hear, you published a story. And he goes, yes. And he goes, you're Chinese? I go, yes. Because I'm a student at Berkeley, and I, I hear you went to Berkeley. He goes, yes. And uh, I said, can I meet you? He goes, meet me at the Med in 15 minutes. The Med was a coffee house, the Mediterranean. Sean showed up, and Frank was there in a leather jacket. Frank was 10 years senior to 19-year-old Sean. And his first words to me were, would you like a cappuccino? And I didn't know what that was. But, you know, it was the 60s, so he just said, yes, <laughs> I'll take some. <laughs> they started talking and didn't stop for months. Sean soaked up everything Frank said like a sponge. He was getting a crash course in Asian American history and culture from someone who was deeply enmeshed in the community. It was like taking Asian American Studies 101, you know. And, and remember, at this time, there was no Asian American Studies classes, you know, and so... I just listened to him talk. Frank and Sean joined forces with Jeff Chan and poet Lawson Inada, another Asian-American writer. They called themselves CARP, Combined Asian-American Resources Project. Someone once called them the Four Horsemen of Asian-American Literature. They knew there were Asian-American writers out there. They just weren't being recognized. And Sean felt a deep sense of responsibility to surface them. As a young writer... I just felt that it wasn't enough for me just to write and publish my own works. I felt that I needed to educate an audience to Asian American literature, to our literary history, you know. And it all began by somebody denying that we had one. And so I set out to prove my professor wrong. We owed it as a personal favor to the older generation that their efforts and their work not be forgotten, that it was time for a younger generation of writers to discover them and to be a part of that literary history. So they scoured used bookstores, snatching up any book that had anything to do with Asian American anything. Luckily, used books were cheap and easy to come by. 10 cents, 25 cents, and we would buy any book that had anything to do with Asian or even mildly Asian American. <clears throat> and so uh, sitting in my office here, you can see I have probably a shelf full of some really racist books about Asians. <laughs> and these were all bought in the used bookstore, you know. Peking Picnic. <laughs> yeah. As a Chinaman saw us is one of the titles. Um <laughs> Chinatown Inside Out. Problem of China. At the time, publishers were only peddling dominant racist tropes, books with bamboo fonts and cringe-inducing images. You know, there's some written in pidgin, sort of pidgin English. There's another one called Daughter of the Samurai. Anyway, they're just ridiculously bad books. But their search led to one book that they found in a used bookstore for 50 cents that really stood out. It was Nono Boy by a writer named John Okada. The book tells the story of Ichiro Okada, a Seattle-born man of Japanese descent living during World War II, who was imprisoned for refusing to denounce the emperor of Japan and resisting military conscription, thereby signaling his disloyalty to the state. I just thought, oh, this is amazing. You know, this is the book we've been waiting for. What was amazing about that book? At the time, we thought, well, this is Japanese America's first novel. Uh, even though it was not set in the camps, it was certainly about the camps. And it was about Seattle. 
And, and so we thought, this is an amazing work, you know. And so we looked in the phone book, <laughs> and there's his name. They called up John Okada. His wife, Dorothy, answered the phone. And we sort of went through our spiel again. We're writers. We read this book. We thought, it's amazing. You know, we want to talk to John. And she said, you're too late. Mm. You know, he died a heart attack. She goes, you missed him by a month. Sean and Frank were devastated, but they made the drive to meet his widow at her home in Los Angeles. They wanted to know more about John Okada. He had written an important and momentous book, and yet no one knew his name. We were not great interviewers. You know, I'm like 20 years old. You know, we asked questions like, uh, what was your marriage like? (laughs) And I remember Dorothy saying, "Uh, John and I like to take separate vacations. And I go, I go, why, you know? (laughs) And then I I don't remember her answer, but, you know, it just seemed, you know, we're like asking about their love life, you know, and how, as well as, you know, how he worked. Sean had learned from Okada's publisher, Charles E. Tuttle, that the author had been working on a second book. So they asked Dorothy about it. She said, yeah, she offered the papers, his papers to UCLA and uh, they had never heard of him, she said, so I burned them. Mm. And I remember Frank and I were sitting there. We are just stunned, you know, looking at her in disbelief. You burned them? She goes, you know, in a fit of despair. She just burned them. And, uh, and so it's gone. There was nothing else that they could read that had been written by John Okada, but they learned that John grew up in Seattle, and that Nono Boy had been published in 1957 in an edition of 1,500 copies. That edition was still available 15 years later, when Sean and Frank showed up. And even then, it was so ridiculously inexpensive. I ordered enough for the entire class, you know, handed them out as gifts. You gotta read this book, here's a copy. Finally, No No Boy sold out. Sean and his friends at CARP didn't want to see Okada's book fade farther into obscurity, so they got the copyright from the first printing and shopped it around to publishers. Everyone turned them down. They decided to approach the University of Washington Press since Okada was from Seattle. The novel is also set in Seattle. We figured, well, this is ideal. Yida Press also said no. I wrote back to them because I'm just a kid. I'm not going to take no for an answer. You know, I said, you're making a big mistake. You know, this is not right. You need to reconsider. And they wrote back and they said, "Um, if you give us $5,000, we'll publish it. I said, well, that's a bunch of bullshit. (laughs) Sean and his friends decided to publish it themselves. Which is what we did. And we didn't have $5,000. They only had $1,500, but they got a friend of theirs to design the book. And they found a printer that would print 3,000 copies for $3,000. And best of all, they only wanted 50% of the payment up front. So we had $1,500, but we didn't have the other (laughs) $1,500. So they started to hustle. They were going to have to sell a lot of books fast in order to pay the printer the second installment. They contacted a columnist at the Pacific Citizen newspaper, a paper for Japanese Americans. I said, you know, we don't have any money to buy an ad, but if you could mention this book in your column, and here's my address, and we'll take $2 off. Pretty quickly, things started happening. Japanese America started sending in checks, you know, and you would see these order forms um, make their way down the block, right, from one household to the other. People sent checks, but they also sent letters. These letters were written by a generation of Japanese Americans that were hungry for their own stories, letters Wong has kept and looks back at even today. Here it is. send a copy to my father, Akibe, who experiences his own kinds of difficulties and evacuation. 
in closing the four dollars I still owe for the books. <laughs> so thank you for sending them, even though my payment wasn't sufficient. <laughs> so sweet. <laughs> And the most amazing thing happened. We had a printing of 3,000. We sold all 3,000 before it came off the press. That's amazing. Sean and friends packaged, addressed, and mailed all 3,000 copies themselves. They filled out invoices, processed receipts, stuffed envelopes, licked stamps, and waited in long post office lines over and over again. During Christmas season, too. But their work paid off they were able to pay the printer. And we sold every single copy by mail of the first printing, almost entirely to Japanese Americans. We didn't even sell a single book to a bookstore. They were able to immediately order a second printing. Sean graduated from grad school in San Francisco and drove up to Seattle. Here, he continued to sell Nono Boy, selling the books out of the trunk of his yellow Mustang, and he branched into bookstores. I thought, oh, there's this Japanese grocery store, Wajimaya. Wouldn't it be great if they sold Nono Boy by the checkout stand? You know, these uh, commercial novels by the, you know, at the Safeway checkout stand. So I went in there, and I had 10 copies of Nono Boy, and Tomio Moraguchi, the owner, I found him. I didn't know him. I said, so... I've published this novel, Nono Boy, and I was wondering if you would sell it in your store. And Tomio looked at me, and he goes, how many you got there? I go, I have 10. He goes, I'm going to buy all 10 of those for me. <laughs> I go, really? And he goes, I want my own copy, and I'm going to give the other nine away. He says, you bring me 25 of them tomorrow. And we knew Nono Boy's time had come. Nono Boy was also getting press attention. The Seattle Times wrote a story about it and its journey to being published. And I get a call the next day from Don Elgood, the director of UW Press. And he says to me, we read that article about Nono Boy in the newspaper. And he says, we'd like to meet with you. I got, oh, oh, hell. <laughs> What have I done now? You know, 27 years old, <laughs> trying to be a writer. Uh, I've pissed off the UW Press. So I go in there, and I sit at the conference table, and the entire staff is sitting there. It's a huge conference table. Don Elgood stands up, and he walks over to me. I'm sitting at the head of the table, and he says, on behalf of the University of Washington Press, I'd like to apologize for not publishing No No Boy. We would like to publish it now. And I looked at him and I went off the deep end. <laughs> I said, what? You got to be kidding me. I said, Do you realize how much work it is to publish a book? <laughs> I said, and it came off the press at Christmas time and I labeled and mailed every one of those 3,000 copies at Christmas time at the post office. Do you know what that's like, <laughs> standing in line with 3,000 copies of a book <laughs> that you have packaged and stapled and wrapped and put stamps on? I said, no, you can't publish it. <laughs> Sean told UW Press that there were other Asian American writers out there, like Toshio Mori, Monica Sone, Carlos Bulasan and Diana Chang. They should publish them. And UW Press listened. A few years later, in 1979, Sean transferred the rights to UW Press for the symbolic sum of $1. Ever since, UW Press has published No No Boy, and to date, they've sold 180,000 copies, seven times the number of books that most novelists sell of their first work. Sean has taught at UW since 1984. He's taught classes on Asian American literature and Asian American studies, which has also enabled him to continue being a champion for Okada's book. I think what's interesting is that No No Boy has gone through several lives, really. People are still discovering that book. 
recently um, uh, the University of Washington Alumni Association made it their uh, pick for their book club. And so mm, people are still discovering the book and uh, embracing it. Sean now has his own book series at the UW Press. He's still publishing books that are out of print 50 years after he began. And the next book that we're bringing out is uh, also been out of print for at least 20 years, which is uh, Willis Kim's Dancer Dawkins and the California Kid, Korean-American writer who's often credited with being the very first lesbian Korean-American author, uh, poet, published. She's very much a literary activist in the 70s herself. I actually cold called her too because I couldn't get her email address, but I found her phone number cold called her and said, I'm so-and-so, um, you're the author of Dancer Dawkins and the California Kid. I, I was wondering if we could reissue it. And she called me back and she goes, who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm Sean Wong. She goes, I know who you are, but why or did you want to do this? I said, because your book is, is a historic part of Asian American literature and it needs to be back in print. It's part of our literary legacy. And uh, she just couldn't believe it. She goes, this is amazing. <laughs> Nobody even talks about my book. Mm -hmm. I said, but it's time. I love how full circle your own story has been, like starting out in, in your 20s, trying to find and publish these authors. And then here you are calling this author kind of like you were when you were a kid and just finding the numbers in the phone book and kind of wide-eyed. I don't really think it's my... Um, it's my calling. And all this time, I was trying to prove my American literature professor wrong, you know? We did write something, and and I was going to find them. And I was going to, to major in Asian American literature, except it required me actually going and seeing them. And that's how we sort of discovered Asian American literature. Asian American literature today is blossoming, if not thriving. Not a month goes by without a new novel, poetry collection, or memoir by a rising Asian American writer arriving into the world. And Asian American literature and Asian American studies now have their own place in academia, thanks to visionaries like Sean Wong. There's a little more to the story. In 2019, Penguin Random House claimed that the rights to Nono Boy had entered into the public domain. They printed a new, unauthorized version without informing the Okada family. Sean mounted a public shaming campaign on social media. It resulted in the publisher withdrawing all copies of Nono Boy from distribution in the United States. The press agreed to pay royalties to the Okada family for all copies delivered to bookstores in the United States prior to withdrawal and for all copies sold abroad. Sean's legacy is as an activist as much as an author and publisher. I'm not really a literary scholar. I'm more of a literary activist. I'm completely self-taught. Uh, all that I understand about Asian America literature is not learned in college. I taught it to myself. The fact that I'm, I became a professor is really an accident. <laughs> you know, I was asked to teach something I taught myself. And, and, uh, I've been now doing it for 50 years. Sean Wong is a teacher, writer, and literary activist. You can find a list of some of the books he talked about in our episode notes. Next week's object is a bike. 10,000 Things is produced by KUOW in Seattle. Our host, writer, and creator is me, Shin Yi Pai. Whitney Henry Lester produced this episode. Jim Gates is our editor. The show art is designed by Eason Yang with photography from Riva Keller. Original music by Tomo Nakayama. Our production team includes Michaela Giannotti Boyle, Hans Twite, and Brendan Sweeney. Special thanks to our community advisor group for providing feedback on this season. Partial funding of 10,000 Things was made possible by the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture Hope Corps Grant, a recovery-funded program of the National Endowment for the Arts, plus support from the Windrose Fund. Thanks for listening.
Hey, my name's Claire McGrain, and I'm a producer for Seattle Now, KUOW's local news podcast. There is a lot happening in our region, and it's a lot of work to keep track of it all. We'll get you caught up on the latest news and take a deep dive into something happening around the city, all in under 15 minutes. Get a morning walk-in or grab a cup of coffee and start your day with us. Learn something new and connect with our city by searching for Seattle Now wherever you get your podcasts.